Thank you for staying tuned. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. This is the audio portion of the commentary to Parashat Shof team. And if you missed part A and B, I recommend you go back and listen. We talked at length about the topic known as oral Torah, otherwise known as Talmud, otherwise known as Torah Sheba al sometimes referred to as Halakha. Halakha is a fancy Hebrew term that refers to the way in which to walk out the written Torah. We tried to talk about this topic of how important is the oral tradition to Christianity today, to Messianic Jews who find themselves siding with Christians quite often and uh, many times to the disappointment of their non-Messianic Jewish counterparts. You see, today we have a discussion that is quite heated at times between whether or not the oral tradition carries weight for a Messianic Jew, certainly for a Christian, but Messianic Jews are people who find themselves, people such as myself, Messianic Jews find themselves caught in the middle between following the Jewish tradition that they were raised with, or that they have embraced, and following along with the Christian tradition that they have also embraced through the person and work of Jesus the Messiah. It, in fact, is a difficult place to uh, navigate through, especially when we Messianic Jews hold so much respect for our own Jewish traditions, to include the writings of the rabbis, the Agadic materials, the, Mishne, um, uh, the Midrashic materials, uh, the Mishnahs and the, and the Gemaras, the Talmud. And all of these, um, <clears throat> all of these uh, areas carry with them um, a little bit of truth and a little bit of uh, personal opinion. When you read through some of the Talmudic uh, writings, you're going to find that much of what they have to say is rooted squarely in the Torah of Moshe. But the uh, difficulty arises when we try and sort out what part of it applies to me as a Messianic Jew and what part of it does not apply to me because I do not espouse to everything that the rabbis teach, particularly when many of the rabbis of the Talmud, we're not, we can't be certain which ones did and which ones didn't. But for the most part, it's a safe assumption to say that many of the teachers of the Talmud did not espouse to faith in Jesus. Therefore, their rulings are going to, in some way, necessarily contradict some of the things that Yeshua said. To be sure, if a tradition seeks, and whether it's rabbinic or Christian, it doesn't matter, but if a tradition seeks to separate believing Jews from believing Gentiles... Excuse me, caught something caught in my throat there. If a tradition seems to separate believing Jews from believing Gentiles, then it's my experience that such a tradition needs to be jettisoned in within a messianic setting. Uh, believing Jews and Gentiles, as I um, am not ashamed to say, are both fellow heirs uh, to the commu- to the covenants of promise that God has given to Abraham. If you are Gentile and you have place your faith in Jesus, it doesn't matter if you have Jewish heritage or not. The Torah is your um, it is your uh, inheritance. It is your blueprint for godly living. And you do not need to be Jewish to follow the Torah. That is, that is a primary thrust of the commentaries that I produce um, here at this website at graftedin.com. So, getting back to the oral tradition and its relevance to Deuteronomy chapter 17, the rabbis of today seem to gain their impetus from Deuteronomy 17 and verses such as that that say that, hey, because the Torah says to appoint judges for your day, you are to listen to what the judges have to say, and we are those judges, the rabbis would claim. Now, in days gone by, um, that would have been more true for the Jewish communities when they were governing themselves. However, in countries such as the United States, where we don't have full-blown Jewish communities complete with um, Jewish judges sitting on the court benches, uh, I don't see that the rabbis have that same authority. authority. Now, they do have religious authority, but they don't seem to carry the same civil authority that the Deuteronomy 17 passage is hinting at. Therefore, Yeshua's words in Matthew chapter 23, the first three pasukim, don't seem to carry the same weight then as they do today, meaning the judges who sit in the seat of Moshe of, of Yeshua's day seem to have had religious and civil authority, but today the rabbis don't seem to have that same authority, at least in civil courts and state courts and things like that. Religious authority, yes. Civil authority, I don't see it happening that way. Um, I'm just giving my viewpoint on this matter, and I I do believe that many Messianics seem to agree with me. David Stern lended his uh, opinion, and we, we pulled a quote from him, 
and that uh, he seems to see that Yeshua is actually transferring a certain amount of authority from the judges of that day of the first century over to the uh, the Talmudim that he was raising up. Perhaps Yeshua knew that the temple was going to be destroyed and that there was going to be a power struggle. Perhaps that's why Yeshua warned us about um, the titles of rabbi and such later on in that particular passage uh, where the um, matters of um, hypocrisy are concerned, leaders who bear titles that, that don't follow through with their own um, teachings are obviously hypocrites, and we are to be leery of such leaders. Also, when it comes to the title rabbi, um, if your authority is vested in an earthly man, and a man who calls himself father or rabbi, and you are not, as a believer, Yeshua, looking to the master as your ultimate authority, well, then you are already in a problematic position as well. Yeshua would caution you, I am the ultimate rabbi, I am the ultimate father, I am the ultimate um, uh, leader and teacher in your community, and you do not need to pull your authority from an earthly man. Your ultimate spiritual authority rests on my, um, uh, uh, as it were, uh, um, What's the word I want to use? My ordination. <laughs> if I were Yeshua speaking as a rabbi. I am the ultimate ordained rabbi, and you need to look to me. Uh, that's, not, that's not to say that I don't believe that we can have messianic rabbis. I, I actually believe we can. Um, but um, in the present community that I serve, at Kehilat Tenuvah, we don't hold to such a halakhic ruling, and I submit myself to that halakha. Therefore, I go with their ruling that we don't use the term rabbi. However, Yeshua seems to be cautioning um, everyone hearing his words and afterwards who would espouse to his own teachings, uh, cautioning them uh, in regards to matters of authority. And that's really where that whole passage of Matthew chapter 23 seems to gain the most amount of momentum. Uh, is in the matters of authority. So that's why we've been talking about these issues today in my commentary. I want to turn now to a final um, section in my commentary which deals with the prophet of our Torah portion. God refers, or he, he promises Moshe that he's going to raise up a prophet from among their brethren. And uh, it's interesting that by first century standards and expectations, the people had already suspected Jesus of being the prophet. So let's turn now to a discussion of this person, the prophet. Um, if you've got the written notes, we're at the top of page 7 with the section entitled, The Prophet, or Hanavi. Now, uh, interestingly, my name is Ariel Hanavi. What does Hanavi mean? It means the prophet. And I'm not trying to suggest by using the term Hanavi that I am the prophet. Far from it. I would be crazy to equate myself with the prophet. I firmly believe that the prophet is Yeshua. However, the Hebrew term ha means the, and the Hebrew term navi means prophet, therefore my name simply means the prophet. The rest of the Torah portion here goes on to explain matters involving a chosen king, additional priestly duties, and the office of prophet, military advice, and finally what to do in case of unknown deaths in the land. I'm not going to comment on all of these areas. I simply want to focus on the prophet, the Hanavi. Moshe first describes the coming of a Navi, a prophet, whom Hashem himself will raise up. Now, a Navi that Moshe promises is going to be similar to himself. God, of course, giving Moshe this insight. This gives us our first qualification of such an office. Okay, The prophet, or the priest, or the king, or anyone who's to sit in a position of leadership within Israel, first and foremost, must be chosen by God. That is the first qualification of such an individual. He is chosen by Hashem. And that, of course, includes the prophet. The promise is given that in his mouth, the prophet, will be the words of Hashem. Accordingly, all the people are to listen to this man, to this individual. Whoever doesn't listen to the words which are spoken in the name of Hashem, well then, you know the consequences. They're going to answer directly to the Holy One. This, by the way, gives us the second qualification of a Navi. A prophet is someone who speaks in the name of Hashem. He doesn't speak his own words. His authority is vested from heaven. Finally, Moshe tells us in this passage in Deuteronomy here, uh, he tells the people that if the Navi speaks presumptuously, or if the prophecy of the Navi doesn't come to pass, then the people are to then know that he is a false prophet. Navi, that he's a false prophet, and that eventually he must die. 
So Deuteronomy 18 is a very, very important prophet. I'm sorry, I'm sorry a very important passage when helping us identify who exactly is a true prophet and who exactly are false prophets. Now, according to the apostolic scriptures, the Brit Chadashah, the Renewed Covenant, Yeshua did indeed fulfill this prophecy. You'd like to look for references in Matthew 11, verse 3. Uh, I think there's one possibly at Matthew 21, 11. You can look at Luke 7, 16, and possibly again at Luke 24, 19. Don't forget to look up John 1, 21, John 6, 14, Acts 3.22, and then look at Acts 7.37 to see that the prophet, capital T-H-E, capital P-R-O, P-H-E-T, the prophet was presumed to be Yeshua of that day. They looked at him and they said, you know, we believe you're the prophet. Now, presumably because messianic expectation ran very high in the first century, many people were open to the fact that Yeshua was indeed, quote unquote, the prophet. They had read the scriptures, and they had expected this man to come on the scene. Therefore, when Yeshua came, he fit the mold. They believed he was him. However, non-Messianic Judaism, and what was most likely, I believe, defensive theology against Yeshua, took another stance. Rabbi Shlomo Itachi, a.k.a. Rashi. He lived from uh, 1040 to 1105 in the Common Era, or, or after the destruction of the Temple. Um, he says that it means when he, you know, refer, commenting on this particular passage, he says that it means that Hashem will raise up a prophet in Moshe's place, quote, and so on from prophet to prophet, end quote. That is the passage here in Deuteronomy. Let me just turn to it so I can give you the exact address um, that I'm referring to. Deuteronomy 18. Verse 15 reads, quote, Adonai will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves, from your own kinsmen. You are to pay attention to him. End quote. This Pasik is the one that I'm referring to that Rashi comments on. He says that it refers to, um, uh, uh, you know, that God will raise up a prophet in Moses' place and so on from prophet to prophet. That is, Rashi goes on to say that the passage does not speak of only a single individual prophet to come, but of the Tanakh's many prophets of whom Malachi, Malachi, was the last. Now, I do believe that Rashi has some um, validity, because every prophet that came after Moshe is, in a sense, following in the footsteps of Moshe. So, to one degree, Rashi is right. The passage is referring to every prophet who would come after Moshe. Everyone must agree with Moshe, because Moshe is the premier prophet of the Tanakh. He is the he is the mold in which all the other prophets were to later step into, because Moshe handed down the words of Torah, and every other prophet must agree with Torah, or else he is a false prophet. Therefore, Rashi's statement is accurate to a degree. However, um, I believe there's a bit of room for disagreement, and I'm going to uh, elaborate here in a moment. A well-known example of defensive theology, in case, you're under, in case you're not sure what I'm referring to, is found in the 12th century creed of Maimonides, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, a.k.a. the Rambam. And he lived from 1135 to 1204 of the Common Era. Reading from the Yigdal, which is found in any standard prayer book these days, um, it reads, quote, I believe with perfect faith that the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, peace be unto him, was true, and that he was chief of the prophets, literally father to the prophets, the Hebrew says, both of those who preceded him and those who came after him. Okay? End quote. Uh, the reason I call it defensive theology is because Maimonides is discounting Yeshua in his statement there where he says that I believe that, that Moses is the father of all the prophets. So it seems that the current Judaisms of today, the non-Messianic Judaisms, do not believe that this passage here in our Torah portion, uh, Deuteronomy 18.15, they don't believe that it refers to Yeshua. Instead, uh, they simply uh, leave it at its reference to the later prophets who would come after Moshe, which again, I believe carries some amount of um, accuracy in their interpretation of that. But to discount Yeshua as the ultimate fulfillment of this prophet um, ignores the uh, abundant historic 
uh, evidence that shows that the first century Judaism's we're looking for a singular man to step into the role of the prophet, capital T H E, and that these same first century people um, were looking to Yeshua as the fulfillment of this. Let's again quote David Stern at length. Quote Was Yeshua, quote unquote, a prophet like Moshe? End quote. Yes, and more. A prophet speaks for God, which Yeshua did, but he also spoke as God. He spoke what the Father gave him to say, as did all the prophets, but he and the Father are one, according to John 10.31. Stern goes on to say, Moshe explained the sacrificial system for atonement. Yeshua was the final sacrifice for sin, the eternally effective atonement. Moshe established the system of Kohanim with his brother Aharon as the first Kohen Gadol of the tabernacle. By comparison, the resurrected Yeshua is the eternal Kohen Gadol in the heavenly tabernacle that served as model for the earthly one. Reference Hebrews chapter 7 verse 10. Finally, Sturden goes on to say, At no point did Yeshua contradict what Moshe said. Rather, he clarified and strengthened the Torah. And you can read Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 through 20. Uh, he goes on to say that Yeshua made its application plainer, according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through chapter 7, verse 29. And Yeshua sometimes himself was the application, end quote. That footnote was taken from um, Stern's, common, uh, Stern's commentary, again, the Jewish New Testament commentary, J&T Publications, 1996, this time from page 231. As I close my commentary today to Parashat Shoftim, let me just state that it is unfortunate that the nation as a whole, the nation of Israel, failed to listen to everything that the Nava Yeshua had to say, as our Parashat in chapter 18, verse 19 predicted that some might. However, today, we don't have to harden our hearts as they once did, and still do to this very day. To be sure, the Torah teaches that one day, They, our Jewish brothers and sisters, will have to give an answer to Yeshua himself concerning their corporate rejection of him. But the Torah also teaches that all day long, Hashem has his arms outstretched to those who would listen to him and to his Messiah. Patiently he waits for us to listen to the words of the prophet. If you're Jewish today and you're listening to my podcast and you don't have Messiah, Yeshua, I might add, I urge you to listen to the words of the Navi today. Listen to his words, okay? Quote, Yes, indeed, I tell you, it wasn't Moshe who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father is giving you the genuine bread from heaven. For God's bread is the one who comes down out of heaven and gives life to to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread from now on. Yeshua answered, I am the bread which is life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever trusts in me will never be thirsty. End quote. That's taken from John chapter 6, verse 32 through 35. And with that, I bid you a, a Shabbat Shalom. But before I bid you a Shabbat Shalom, let's close our commentary. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Torah Temet Vechaye Olam Natabat Ocheinu Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe. You have selected us. I'm sorry, you have given us your Torah of truth and have planted everlasting life within our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. That concludes our show for today. Remember, because the Messiah has already come, the Torah is now a document meant to be lived out in the life of a faithful follower of Yeshua through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh to the glory of God the Father. It should not be presumed that it can be obeyed mechanically, automatically, legalistically, without having faith, without having trust in Hashem, without having love for God or man, and without being empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh. 
to state it succinctly, Torah observance is a matter of the heart, always has been and always will be. My name is Torah teacher Ariel bin Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song was produced and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A number 613 at hotmail.com. Or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com.